just replicating potent and powerful technologies. I know, I know there's the whole meme and the joke about oh, the guard, guards guys who found like a slightly better knife and big whoop, you found a really nice wife. Uh, wife? wife. <laughs> really nice wife. wife. You found the wife. The, wife. <laughs> <laughs> the mechanicus, I just tell you like the, the idea of the mechanicus being happy that someone found a wife is just so, <laughs> so <laughs> stupid. It's Whoever the mechanicus <laughs> <laughs> Whoever finds the Hatsune Miku STC. <laughs> no. Oh, no. What is this anime oh. nonsense you're talking about? Uh, you know what? Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Hello, everyone, and welcome once more to Lore Crimes. Today, we are once again moving forward in the Warhammer timeline. We have covered the rise and fall of the Eldari, and now it is time for the birth of the Imperium. Ooh. And I'm very excited for this one, because now I can sit here naysaying in the corner instead of Andy doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> The revenge has already we'll begun. See. To be honest, you're going to have a lot of that because the Elder are more or less irrelevant from now on. You know, they're just kind of there. Oof. The sidelines. Oof. Fighting Oof. words. Oh, look Jeez. at how hard he's seething and it's not even a full <laughs> minute. <in> <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. They will be fun, ladies and mm. gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Would, uh, <laughs> should we just jump right in, fellas? How Let's jump straight in. There? Uh, so today it will be with Andy. He'll be leading us all uh, in the beginner section. So I think take it away, Andy. Give it. Okay. Give give the boys their law. I see. Okay. I misread who was doing beginner and <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm I'm just gonna with my A section. I'm gonna basically just do like a brief overview of what we're gonna talk about. Then a few points, and then I'll pass it over to Hal to flesh things out a bit. So. What we're covering today spans from about 8,000 BC to the 30th millennium, just about predating the Great Crusade as far as timeline is concerned. We're going to cover a lot of stuff about the Emperor of Mankind in particular, because he's very important at this stage, as he always is, because, you know, mm. I love Big E. Um, and I'll, I'll get this out of the way at the start. There's probably going to be a lot of speculation in this episode, but we're going to mention when it is speculation, so we're not like not kind of muddying the lore or the history so that people go, oh, they're, t they're talking about stuff that's not confirmed or whatever. We'll, we'll mention specifically when we're, we're spitballing, when we're not sure. Um, and this is going to go through everywhere from the, 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 the kind of formation of you know humanity spanning the stars to the dark age of technology, the age of strife, men of iron, thunder warriors, techno barbarians, the whole gamut. So, all the good stuff. All sorts of stuff. Um, but to start with, let's just begin with uh, the most important character in 40k, which is the Emperor of Mankind. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, not, says, he's not Gilliman. Uh, <laughs> he's better than Gilliman. He is Gilly's daddy. He is, you know, Jimmy Space's daddy space. <laughs> daddy space. Daddy, daddy space. Oh, God. <laughs> this is daddy space. <laughs> I thought we just finished a Slamash video. Oh no! Yeah. Oh god! <laughs> All right. Anyway, enough silliness. Um. So, who is the emperor? The emperor. Um. We're going to go into the nitty gritty with Hal section, but to give you an overview of the emperor, he is an extremely powerful psyker in the forty first millennium. Arguably one of the most powerful beings in existence. Uh, he's intimately connected to his powers to the warp. He is a figure from history that keeps coming up. Time and time again, this speculation, um, you, you could probably guess uh, an actual person from our own history, and in the Warhammer timeline, that's probably been the Emperor once or twice. Like, it could have been that Julius Caesar was, like, an early version of the Emperor, or, or you know, do we have any, any ideas of who he could have been in the rise of, of humanity that we know from our history? Dame, uh, Dame Judy Dench. Dame Judy Dench. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Not really specific. I just like to imagine, like, I, I don't know why. I imagine he was involved in the Manhattan Project. And one of the, one of those scientists, I feel like, has got to have been him. 
True. That's well, actually a good he, point. That's a yeah. really. I never thought about that one. Well, he's, he's, this is the thing that uh, he's probably been both at the foreground and the background of many events in history. So he would have led wars as a general. He would have developed scientific breakthroughs behind the scenes. He would have been advisors to world leaders. He would have been a king. He would have been, you know, every kind of I would say like influential figure, and has given him a, a length of breadth of knowledge and experience beyond anyone else in humanity's history, or even most creatures in the galaxy. He's he's done it all. Um, with, with with his particular start, uh, he 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 began his ascent as the most powerful creature in humanity's history during the kind of coalescence of um, sentient life within the warp. So chaos kind of got bolstered with the start of humanity and its emotional ties to the immaterium. And as the forces of chaos coalesced within the warp, so too did humanity as it got more progressively stronger it would also bolster the warp with it. Uh, this is also why the three main chaos gods that we do like, uh, more than the, the elven one, uh, were born. <laughs> so you got Corny Boy, you got Nurgly Boo, and Sinchi Face. Corn they is were all the born. worst of them all. Hmm? Corn is the worst. I hate him. How do you, Corn? He's too blunt. He's just like, I like punching things. Yeah, that's all you need. There's no elegance. There's no style. Um, Good. But yeah. It's better than, you know, the... the uh... Corn can't do a kickflip on his skateboard. Let's just say that. No. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think I think Corn would be pretty sick on, you know... He'd break it in half. Games. I think he'd break it in half and then, like, walk off all stroppy like a teenager. <laughs> I, I can imagine Seench having those rollerblade shoes. You know, he's like, I'm not going to have a skateboard. I'm going to have something with me. more mobility. And, and, and eyes. Because he's, he's a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> he's got those shoes. Um, oh. Massive Sonic fan, um, but yeah, and uh, as um, as the Chaos Gods are doing their thing and they're growing in power during the Middle Ages, the Emperor is becoming more dominant in history. He uh, he actually fights a Void Dragon during the Middle Ages, um, and it's believed he is kind of uh, the physical manifestation of the the legend of Saint George, who who, who slew a dragon, and um, apparently he sealed this Void Dragon un in Mars. I don't know how he did that because space travel wasn't a thing yet, but he, he did it somehow. He held his breath uh, for a really long time. <laughs> <laughs> just He's just in. that cool. Yeah. I mean, th there's also possibly the idea that maybe the Void Dragon kind of influenced the uh, the Mechanicus and how they see things as well because the Void Dragon is basically a Katanja. We'll go into that more later. Um, humanity then, after this point, with the Emperor beating the Dragon, he gets more powerful. Humanity gets more and more advanced over time. They start to uh, colonize the star system. They venture into the wider galaxy without faster than light travel at the moment. But, you know, they're, they're colonizing the solar system and they're, they're getting a bit further out. Uh, they start to encounter aliens. They cooperate with them because they're not jaded and, you know, battered dummies, like they dummies. are in the 41st millennium. <laughs> I think, yeah, because if you're new within Warhammer, all you know is like the Imperium humanity despises alien is i'm pretty sure it's why uh andy maybe you can admit to hating the eldar so much is because a little bit of imperium bias but at this time that's it's very good reason it's good uh, reasoning they had their cake they ate it and then they started to you know do unseemly things with the cake so I'm very <laughs> <sympathetic> there, <but laughs> after, after after 60 million years yeah true but still um <laughs> what eldar about that uh so eventually um they start to develop Gellerfield technology so they can expand even further into the unknown of the galaxy. They develop STCs, which are standard te template constructs, which are so incredibly useful that even during the 41st millennium, not just humanity, but every species is trying to get their hands on them because they're so useful at just replicating potent and powerful technologies. I know, I know there's the whole meme and the joke about Oh, the guard, guards guys who found like a slightly better knife and big whoop you found a really nice wife uh, like wife <laughs> from his <laughs> eyes wife. you found <laughs> you the wife, the, wife, the, wife. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the mechanicus I just funny. like the, the idea of the mechanicus being happy that someone found a wife is just so, <laughs> so <laughs> stupid it's whoever finds the Hatsune Miku STC whoever finds the Hatsune Miku STC no oh 
Oh, <laughs> no. What is this anime um, nonsense you're talking about? Oh, uh, you know what? Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, so they, they, the SDCs are doing well. The Galafields making them expand. Golden age of humanity sees unprecedented peace, prosperity, breakthroughs in architecture and art and technology, and it's the equivalent of human paradise. Um, and, it, and it's at this point that humanity does a bit of a mistake, and it goes, okay, well, we've already got all this going on. Why, why don't we take the next logical step and develop AI, and then uh, things go terribly wrong. Uh, humanity creates them so well that the robots become sentient and start to rebel. Uh, revolt is so extremely perilous for the safety of the galaxy that not only humanity wages war with them, but they actually band together with other Xenos species, including the orcs of all people, mm. just to stop the, uh, the the AI from taking over because they are so powerful. Some strange um, friends. Yeah. And um, that's why to this very day, a lot of people say, oh, the Mechanicum's weird. Oh, they have like all these lobotomized people and servitors. And it's like, because they hate, because the history of AI in humanity's history is so detrimental to its progress and prosperity, they are like, we're erring completely on the side of caution. Never again, never again, never again, no more AI. Um, and of course, you know, uh, this war is so catastrophic with the the, the uh, war against man and machine. By the end of it, uh, warp storms and destruction and calamity are all over the galaxy. It's, it's, it's completely destabilized the very, uh, very fabric of reality that it's been... The, the destruction left in its wake is absolutely terrible, and it's the first proper nail in the coffin for humanity's downward descent um humanity because they reject not just ai but other technologies that are kind of close to that precipice very quickly start to descend and regress into a less technologically sophisticated species and in the case of a big empire across the stars it completely breaks down and terra the home world where we live which we would call earth becomes a barbaric state ruled by techno barbarians. My goodness. Now, I think uh, Colin will be Colin need to soak in and enjoy this moment as much as you can. I, I am is this uh, El Eldor boy here. Is <laughs> this is because it's gonna get better after this. <laughs> so you have to enjoy the misery. <laughs> short short a short what, fifteen thousand years before they screwed themselves over? It's uh, not quite re not quite hitting the record, are we? Mm. Yeah, well, at least they didn't create Necrons with their, you know, like massive human sacrificial pyre things. And, you know, anyway, um, the Elder didn't and, do that. Well, they were involved. So <laughs> the old ones, the old ones are the real bad guys in forty k. I can, I can settle on that. Their dads. Um, and it's, it's this point where the Emperor has been doing a lot of stuff. He's he's not. He hasn't been in charge of humanity up to this point. He's just been kind of involved. And it's at this point he goes, right, we were doing so well. And look where we are now. I'm going to take the reins. I think I'm the only person who can right this ship. And he starts to see to the retaking of Terra. And he creates a genetic, an army of genetically modified super soldiers one would be the Custodes, the Adeptus Custodes that we all love, which are very painstakingly made and they take a lot of work. And because of such, they are very few, at least in terms of the scale of most armies in Warhammer. Uh, and then he also made uh, the Thunder Warriors, who were designed just to retake Terra. And these soldiers were given failsafe, so they couldn't they were designed so that they could basically just brutalize anything they were pointed towards. And because they were so violent and unstable, the Emperor basically made it so that they had like horrific cancers embedded in their genetic coding. So once they'd done their job, he could just go like, right, wipe my hands clean. We don't need them anymore. They're not going to be any use after all the slaughter. Um, but nonetheless, he retakes Terra. He unifies Terra. He... He bands together all of his um, custodies. He also develops the uh, Adeptus Astartes, which are the next generation of super soldiers. They they slaughter the Thunder Warriors, and then he says, right, the, 
new warriors, these Adeptus Astartes, they have to be capable of going out into the galaxy, no matter what the environmental, or we're going to re, we're going to find all our lost fragments of our empire. We're going to b- bind it back together with like galactic duct tape, almost. <laughs> and we'll bring everything back to the fold, and we will retake our place as the dominant species of the galaxy. And at this point, he launches the Great Crusade. And that's basically the overview of what we're talking about today. Seems like a very hostile work environment. That's the, the person that came to mind for the Thunder Warriors. Are probably like, I want... me... so go ahead, go ahead, Eli. Oh, okay, and uh, it made me think of like a the Emperor doing like a, like a Flex Seal commercial. Oh, he really like yeah, slaps it on. <laughs> but it's like him in like it's him green screened in like the galaxy. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that image. I like that image. Slapping on the tape, like look how it seals this <laughs> like water spout. Oh my god! So, you know, a, that'd be that's just like the neck runs when they're flexing. Like we could close the eye of terror. Wap. Zap. <laughs> before we uh, before we move on to the next stage, do any of you two have any questions or things maybe that are lingering in your mind that you want to verbalize before we uh, move on? Uh, do you think that the orcs were still the crook when they were? It's allying with humanity, so. or they're like halfway in between orc and crook at that point, so they're not completely. I think crazy Col- maybe yet. even Colin might be able to answer that as someone maybe a bit because we, we did the War in Heaven uh, episode. Uh-huh. Shout out, please watch that uh, before the, this episode. <laughs> but yeah. maybe Colin might have a bit of a knowledge uh, on that. If you'd like to throw it my way, sure, I can kind of give at least my best guess on the matter. I would say by this point, probably not, because each of the crooks were at least in terms of physical might, probably not too far off from like Primarchs and stuff. Mm-hmm. And if there were any of those running around, I think Biggie would have had a lot harder time. I think just <laughs> not even Biggie. I think humanity, like before everything fell apart, would have had a lot harder time going around mm-hmm. if there were still anything close to one of them rampaging. So I'm guessing by this point they had, uh, they had become orcs. They'd all gone on a holiday. <laughs> Yeah, the crook, the crook went to bed, and then their drunken children, the orcs, <laughs> were front. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, so uh, with that said and done, uh, we will now move on to the expert section. I think everyone is puckered up and ready for this injection of law, because we've got, uh, this is mostly, to be fair, uh, humanity's story. A few little touches of uh, Xenos there, but Colin will have to sit through and endure this one <laughs> and, right. as we talk about the uh, birth of the Imperium. So, Stu, <laughs> just le- lean back and relax. <laughs> so, we begin at the start of our story with humanity. So, humanity itself was created long ago by the old ones. It's implied that we we're not necessarily as we are now, as probably maybe a bit closer towards obviously our common ancestors like monkeys or something like that. But it's implied that obviously the old ones had a hand in uh, our creation. And humanity is sitting here on terror, just, you know, enjoying the sun, foraging, doing all your cool stuff, you know, whatever you do on the weekends. And <laughs> the we sort of fast forward in time we're not really that evolved, but we get to the point where we're about 8,000 plus BC. And this is where we have some unique characters. These are the Perpetuals. And there are the Perpetuals called Alanius Person and Erda. It's not given a specific date of when they're exactly born, but it's implied that they are before 8,000 BC sort of time. Because we hit exactly, it's implied, 8,000 BC and this would be the birth of the man that would be known as the emperor of mankind. Ooh, yeah, big, boy. If everyone's cheering, you know, fireworks are going off. Probably not, <laughs> not, not at the time, but definitely Haven't now. Been developed yet. No, yeah, you know, just they're just throwing like colored rocks in the air or something like that. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the emperor's story begins when he's born in a primitive proto Hittite village. Yes, even to that extent. Uh, for those history people out there, uh, along the banks of the Sakyar River in Anatolia. He was born to a very simplistic tribal life. The first time we actually ever see like an image of him within the Warhammer setting, which is something he actually shows in a vision, is a very like small uh, primitive child and he's holding 
the skull of his dead father. So a bit of a, you know, we get the bit of an intro. You know, what I mean, if everyone's here watched a WWE, it's a pretty metal uh, way to be introduced <laughs> into the story, shall we say? And the sort of the first thing we see, or first way we interact with the emperor, was that he knows that his uh, father has been. Mur- he's holding the skull of his father, and he knows that his father has been murdered by his uncle. And in a, perhaps a either conscious or unconscious uh, decision, he gives his uncle a heart attack and his uncle essentially grabs his chest and he falls over. And it's this is obviously how it reveals that the emperor is obviously a little bit special and he has psychic ability. So he has some kind of magic, shall we say. Are you saying every four-year-old can't just do that at will? Uh, they might try. Like, to fair, when you're growing up, is there one you watch Star Wars and like you try and <laughs> hold out your hand and yeah, you yeah, pretend yeah. you have the force? Grab the remote, you know. I say as a child, I'm pretty sure we've all done it as adults. Like, <laughs> we could all confess every to day. that. Every day. Every, every day. And so the Emperor, he essentially is off his uncle, shall we say, and he uh, immediately after this just leaves his village and he sort of roams across uh, what would be today in the Middle East, and he finds the first ever city of humanity in a little bit of a nod to people who like history. This is most likely ancient Sumeria of Mesopotamia. If anyone here is a big history fan, I know Colin might might appreciate that little uh, extra tidbit there. And I think this is a little bit of speculation here, so big disclaimer. This is where me and Andy think he may have discovered that he was a perpetual. And mm. I think in my own head, that's probably because he didn't die of old age. When yeah. <laughs> so, I, I think at first when we were discussing like, the script for this, I was just like, oh, he fell down like a massive flight of stairs. And then he, just, <laughs> and he did. Everybody, and then he was <laughs> <he's> like, <laughs> oh, that's weird. <laughs> I did see a, I saw a meme earlier, to be fair, which was like um survives world war ii survives world war one and it's like the stairs looking all aggressive <laughs> <laughs> oh man <laughs> bit, bit dark yes. but yeah you know maybe the, the stairs got him mate we're not sure how he discovered he was a perpetual and a perpetual is someone who is essentially immortal they are ageless or they stop aging after a while and they are they regenerate every time they die so the emperor is essentially immortal mm-hmm. and this is a little bit later, so it's not implied exactly how long this took, but the Emperor supposedly met the other perpetual, the older perpetual, Erda, and she met a man who was going by the name of Neoth. I'm not sure if it's his, it's not even said if it's his actual name. There's no, uh, there's actually a modern 40k plot about discovering the Emperor's true name, which is in the uh, Beckwin novels, but. That might be more tied to his psychic power, but the emperor's real name is not really given. But at this time, he's going by Neoth. Be rubbish and, if it was just called Keith. Keith, <laughs> Keith the emperor. Uh, yeah. One thing. One thing before you go further. Does this all confirm that the emperor was like was born and not created by the uh, the old suicide pact shaman stuff. shaman stuff? It may have been that these shamans. Uh, the the shaman theory about how it was thousands of uh, psychers pouring their soul into one being, that being may still have been born. So it, it's not clear if that is still can like not. I wouldn't say it, canon, but we're not it kind sure. Of reminds me of um the origins of the Joker, where it's like there's so many stories about how he turned into the Joker, mm. but they're all like made up. Yeah, you know, no one quite knows the mm. truth. So probably it, like either a, like an amalgam of them or none of them or. Mm. So yes, yeah, it's, it's a little bit of maybe, possibly. It's again a lot of Warhammer stuff. It's intentionally left mysterious, yes. shall we say? I like the, I like the theory that Malkador found him in a box after someone made him in the Dark Age of technology, or <laughs> well, like floating down a river or something. Yeah, he's just this but weapon someone made. Him in a <laughs> isn't, isn't there like a mention of like he's a weapon in um, the Master of Man- Mankind book where? Uh, Valdor is about to kill this woman, and she's like, "Yes, he's a weapon out of the box from the old dark age of technology." And I'm like, "It's Minister Zhu, who's one of the warlords mm. on Terra. She says he's just a weapon left out of his box. Although that may have been more of a just she thinks he's an it's like an, an insult. insult rather than a mm. you know she actually genuinely believes he was a weapon it wasn't in a, a box, physical box, no, 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 you know, mm. you know mental box maybe. 
Um, so Erda, she's met this strange, I guess, so say strange, she's also a perpetual. So she's, they're both equally as weird as each other. Um, so she meets the emperor and she agrees to become one of his sort of semi followers. And this is again, the emperor himself now has discovered someone who's also like him. And so he sort of roams the world and he seeks out other perpetuals to recruit to his cause. And this is obviously many thousands of years in BC. So it's just, you know, he's not obviously, he's walking everywhere. So it's not happening fast, but he's sort of on a, it's sort of a background mission that he's on. And at some point in uh, recorded history, the emperor, it stated that he became a king he even organized his own armies, and then he also met the perpetual Alanius Pius, sorry, Alanius Person, excuse me, and Alanius Person became his war master, even though I think Alanius is probably older than the Emperor, but maybe the Emperor's just so, you know, Chad that he was like, oh, mm-hmm. dude, I didn't know you were tight like that, and he's like, they dabbed up, and he was like, yeah, I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <Please>. <laughs> that's not canon. <laughs> that is, again, speculation. Um so they kind of, they they have a sort of, as there are immortals, they sort of seek to protect humanity and they want to guide it. They are friends at this time. And as they're leading their armies, these two friends besiege a tower in Eastern Phoenicia built by a cult that would be known as the Cogitate. Yes. Yeah. It is very, again, very mysterious. It's kind of, I don't, no one's really sure how they know this, but it, again, it's, like little echoes we have in the uh, Warhammer history. After their forces succeed in capturing this tower, they discovered something called Inusia. And this is a kind of very strange, like ancient language that seems to have an effect on the Warhammer setting. And it starts to bleed corruption and power from the warp. So it's obviously very much tied to that kind of realm of madness, shall we say. Alanius is like, bro, this is terrible. And he demands that they just destroy this tower because obviously it's corrupt. Meanwhile, the emperor, he kind of disagrees and he wants to preserve the knowledge it's held. And the reason he does this because he thinks it's a better way to protect against this corruption is to understand it as much as he can. Uh, Alanius did not agree. So, so he became disillusioned with the emperor. He actually stabbed the emperor uh, with a dagger, nice. and then he uttered one of the lines of Inutia, so there's like a uh, power language, and he actually destroyed the tower and ran off, yeah. essentially. Did a foos rodar, basically. Pretty much. So Alanius <laughs> kind of backstabbed, you know, like, you know, may I trust in you, you know, I'm, I'm happy to follow you. Uh, in that one decision, maybe not, you know, quick shank and he left. So, so that's... Uh, I love Alanius. Alanius is just, he's, he's just, he's in and out, essentially. He's in and out of the story. And... We sort of, time keeps progressing. So humanity itself, we are evolving. We next find ourselves in the Middle Ages. So this is very much unfortunate for us because this is when the first chaos gods are born. Woo, they, good guys are showing up. Some of the seeds may have been planted uh, much earlier in the timeline, but this is when they become into a full conscious state. And this is known in the mirror dimension as, well, we call it the warp. So... The warp itself is just like a, if you are new to Warhammer, just a brief thing about the warp. It's essentially a mirror dimension where all of our like sentient thoughts, like every, even you know, good or bad, any kind of uh, feeling, it all ripples within there, sort of creating, uh, I guess, either, you know, good things and bad things, you know, demons and angels, all that kind of uh, stuff, essentially. It doesn't, it annoyingly does not adhere to any of these strict laws of physics so that's obviously is very much a story writing tool but there's also parts where it's like time makes no sense there too so like oh we could do anything we want but you know i mean it's like surely that you know there's there's trouble with it but it makes it has no uh reason to adhere to our human understanding shall we say and i'll pass over to uh, andy quickly to talk about what the emperor uh, did next in his great journey so uh basically this is the bit i mentioned earlier about how the emperor fought a dragon now 
I said earlier that it, it's implied that he might be uh, a fragment of the Qatar known, of, uh, known as Magladroth the Void Dragon. Um, I should say this isn't explicitly stated anywhere. It's more um, kind of assumed with what we know of him and like little references from other other bits of like lore here and there. Um, but basically, he fought this void. What what? I believe it's just called the Void Dragon or the Dragon of a uh, Dragon that he fights, and he seals it inside of Mars um, in what is, what is called the Noctis Labyrinth. No idea how he did it, really. I mean, as the whole fact that at this point there isn't really space travel yet, so I guess he just yeeted him into Mars or something, or he teleported, or did some kind of warp trickery. Who knows? Big jump. Um, <laughs> Big jump. But- <laughs> but it, but it, it is Maglodroth the Void Dragon. He's the most powerful Catan. So if it is a fragment of him, that's pretty impressive that he was like, I'm not just going to fight a Catan shard. I'm going to best the most powerful one or a bit of the most powerful Catan. So that's pretty cool. Um, and uh, We had a slight theory, by the way, that it was actually Elon Musk that took uh, the Emperor <laughs> all the way to Mars because <laughs> there's... <laughs> Obviously, you know, he's got and he's a ticket there. But this happens um, nice. during the Middle Age period. So, fortunately, it'll be Elongius Muscius or something like that, maybe. <laughs> that's, that's what they and didn't it, tell us about the Tesla launch into space. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, it, and it's still alive today in the 41st millennium. It is watched over by the Guardians of the Dragon on Mars. And um, pretty much all the information that the Imperium knows about it is derived from the Guardians because... They share the memories of the creature. Um, but again, they don't really get out much because they're looking after this big Catan thing in the core of Mars. So, yeah. But, uh, but you know, and, and the Emperor, I believe when he bests the dragon, he also gets like a kind of power buff almost. He's like, oh, I'm so good. Look at me. I beat a dragon. A very sexy moment. Thank you very much there, Andy. And uh, so this was... This is the kind of the emperor's like big moment, I guess, in his, uh, I say early history. He's probably like 15, he's a couple of thousand years old, so he's not exactly young. Get he's, on a bit. His stubble's definitely come through. <laughs> so, yes. uh, so it's for the- crazy how uh, the emperor uh, had to struggle to take down a shard, but Cain beat a full one. Yeah. Oh, he's got it in. He's got it in. Get out of here. Get out of here. You know, oh. say. They're gonna be fighting. We're gonna be. They're gonna be fighting. Uh, there'll be. There'll be fights to, to a different planet. <laughs> there'll be more fights to come, boys. Don't worry. Don't worry. So I'm just saying, you know, Ken gets whooped by regular regular Astartes quite regularly. I'm, I'm that's kind of the sad though, isn't yeah. it? That makes me sad. <laughs> Known as Games Workshop needs this character to look powerful today. <laughs> Very much so. Uh, so for the Emperor's done his like his big. Let's just say he's gone Super Saiyan. He's done his big move. Uh, he's sent the dragon into Mars and now we kind of focus a little bit more on uh, humanity as a whole itself. So humanity is kind of alone on Terra at this time. It's We very much uh, start to uh, sort of begin to populate and terraform the solar system itself. So we've moved a little bit further along in the uh, technological side of things, shall we say. So a little bit... Uh, smarter in general and eventually we were slowly like building again it takes thousands of years so this is when we get to about the fourth millennium and this is the kind of first time that humanity uh in general is like aware of the warp as in they like oh that you know ping light bulb moment that thing (laughs) yeah that what's that oh that's terrifying (laughs) uh so this kind of it's the first time we've interacted with the warp and it it becomes like in general aware of it. Uh, the actual man Neoth, or the man who would one day become the emperor, he very much sort of he's beat the dragon. He slits kind of more into the background picture of humanity. It might be like I think in my own head, speculation. There's a warning here. I think it might be that he gets overshone <laughs> by a lot of other things. I think obviously, like in the forty-first millennium, the emperor is a relic of a different age when all these great things are made and i think this is the time where he does see hasn't necessarily he's not uh, a genius yet because he hasn't gone through all the discoveries because they're happening right now so he's a bit more of a oh i'm learning you could say at this stage 
Although I suppose yeah. if, he, if at this point he's also still of the mind of, oh, we shouldn't be believing in superstition. If they've literally turned him into a parable of, uh, you know, uh, St. George killing the dragon, he's probably like, okay, I need to like step back for a minute. They're starting to, like, they're getting ideas in their heads. So I'm just going to like low key, you know, killing the dragon was fun, but you know, can't, can't, don't, don't look at me yet. Don't look at me. I'm a bit shy. Yeah, ooh, woo. Uh, don't, <laughs> I don't know why I put that there. Um, I thought it'd be fun to ask you guys um, if you had any people in history. We, I think we asked it earlier, but I think Colin said in a different video, you thought Julius Caesar, and even I think we said it earlier in this one as well, we we kind of have a hint that, because a lot of a um, a lot of the symbology of Warhammer, like the Imperial, like Imperial Eagle, Obviously, it might be taken from, you know, I might have nicked it from somewhere else. I wonder if anyone had any different uh, ideas about different people you could have been, possibly. Yeah, I think you could call them a lot of the big conquerors, the really successful commanders and stuff like that. Uh, it goes against everything he believes in, but he could have been like an Odin slash Jesus figure. Mm. Um, and then is like... I don't know what he tried to preach was taken differently or something, but Actually, I never thought of him being Odin. That would be quite cool. Mm-hmm. Although Odin and Jesus have many uh, parallels. Yeah, I have. Mm-hmm. Uh, Go ahead. I say I have heard that. Uh, at least, I mean, this was nothing confirmed in theory. I've just heard someone suggest that he might have uh, been a follower of Jesus. In which case, mm-hmm. he's a great. He shows. <laughs> Oof. Jumping ahead a bit, uh, <laughs> it shows what happens when you tr- when you try and play God and do better at it than his own game. Mm-hmm. Though perhaps I'm jumping a bit too far. I, ahead of the I don't know where. which one we would speculate. <laughs> I just like the idea of like Jesus being like, "Hey, look, I uh, I turned uh, water into wine." The emperor's like, "Dragon, eat it, mate." What, what else? <laughs> Or which of the followers was he in the end? That'll be a bit, you know, it could, could get really probably spicy. The one, yeah, yeah. Probably, it's very, we probably shouldn't go there. Anything, anything Jesus, okay, yeah, uh, sure. I don't know if we should Anybody speculate too hard. More of a Judas figure. Yeah, like, oh, okay, he said it, he said it. <laughs> so, uh, moving on from Jesus, you know, the, 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 the light-hearted topic that that is. Um, when it's getting angry. <laughs> they're, they're already typing. Um, so humanity now is, we're pretty much, you know, we're on the train and it's, it's moving. So humanity, we start to reach the 15th millennium and our technological understanding reaches its zenith. So everything at this time period is awesome. So people will even live longer. Life is pretty peaceful. Um, it's kind of like, I always thought of it a bit like, you know, how, some Star Trek stuff is where it's like, it's a time of exploration and discovery. Like humanity is really curious about what's going on in the stars. You know, like I think, uh, you know, the curiosity of like looking up in the night sky is very much a driving force. We're not really jaded yet, but that will be coming. So hopefully everyone's excited about that part. So uh, many of the technologies that are like really sought after in the 41st millennium, they are created during this kind of uh, millennia spanning like golden age. So we have things like uh, Terminator pattern armor. We have, uh, you know, we we'll say starting off that small, you'll see why. Uh, we go all the way to Titans, which um, mm. if you're new to Warhammer, they are the enormous uh, like clunky robots with, I guess, uh, guns the size of cathedrals on each arm. Yeah, walking cathedral towers with guns. Mm-hmm. I think, yeah, they're pretty, um, they're chunk, shall we say. They're pretty chunky. <laughs> oh, boy, they're thick. They- <laughs> Most of them are, it's coming yeah. <laughs> shit out of you. <laughs> that is a sentence you don't think you'd ever hear in your life, <laughs> but it makes sense. Um, humanity like, even gets to the point where time travel is possible. There's an, a short story, I think, about a ship that, time travels uh, in Warhammer is an interesting uh, mm. part where the time travel ship meets like the modern 40k time around it just basically calls all the humans like scum it is hilarious and there's also something I think is my favorite is just black hole guns uh, which is like <laughs> things like hiding inside some of the Mechanicus equipment there's like even a Mechanicus ship that can phase uh, an object in time like, so basically it creates like a double of itself and it's on top of itself and it basically just implodes. Uh, a bit a bit um, 
yeah, crazy. I don't know if anyone here wants to speculate about what other pieces of technology you think uh, might have come from this era. I think, to be honest, Titans might be probably my favorite just because I think... I'm not exactly sure what it was originally a Titan, but maybe the idea of it being like a plowing machine or something. Like, you know how like knights, <laughs> like, oh, um, or like, I think we we almost, we're not sure if it's canon. So a little bit of speculation here, like Terminator mm-hmm. armor is somewhere in old law, might have been like diving equipment, possibly. Think, we're not I sure if that's the, canon. The, uh, I say again, yeah, this is it's, it's kind of speculation, but I think that, uh, I read that it's the basis for Terminator armor is taken off of what like construction equipment people would wear. Mm-hmm. They essentially just kind of revised it so the black carapace would work with it. I mean, yeah, yeah so it's pretty, I mean, like ludicrous. Yeah, pretty, we're not really <laughs> sure what it was going on, but essentially the the gist is humanity makes some really dope stuff. Like <laughs> it makes them like the cooler, you know, they make the AirPods, they make, you know, those little things that were <laughs> popular a couple of years ago, like you spin well, they, well, those things like the little three fidget claw. Spinners. <laughs> fidget, uh, they made fidget spinners that can fly. I don't know. But, and, yeah, they, made, uh, they made a George Foreman toasty where if you overpack it with too much cheese, it doesn't like come out the sides. It's like, that's whoa. impressive technology. <laughs> it comes out surprised your nose. I haven't seen, surprised I haven't seen a meme where Jane Zar has a fidget spinner. <laughs> I just thought of that now. <laughs> like tricycle weapon. Yeah, the little throwing thing there, or whatever that yeah. is. The idea of her riding on a tricycle, what you just said there, like just rides into the little. <laughs> well, you know, you but know the little. Call something like a tricycle. It or, has a similar name. Or when you say that, I think of the little kid in The Incredibles, <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he's like, you know, the Mister Incredible lifts up the car, and the little kid's on the little tricycle, but it's actually Jane's are, and she's got daggers, like. <laughs> that's what I'm thinking of in my head and Mr. it <laughs> Mr. Incredible is the emperor she's like I'm waiting for you to do something cool <laughs> <laughs> I don't know something amazing <laughs> so yeah humanity makes some like you know some really cool stuff and we're essentially uh, you know as terror is the home world we're sort of blooming our way across the stars we are very much uh, colonizing everything that can be colonized shall we say reasonably so we're on humanity is definitely spreading out, so people are not born necessarily within the solar system anymore. And this is where we first encounter many of the lovely Xenos races, such as orcs, the Eldari, and po- probably at this time uh, numerous other minor Xenos that uh Okay. You know. Oh, we did, definitely the Jakero as well. The monkeys. The monkey men have returned. They are here. Uh, they, why do they look like I uh, have eaten the last ice cream? I don't know why they look at me like that. <laughs> they, make, <laughs> they make me nervous. So he, they've they've definitely, you know, we're on the block, if you know what I mean. Humanity's out there. And again, the tone is more curious. We're not... The 41st uh, you know, millennium, the grim dark future isn't there yet. So it's much more chill although i think we have speculated that the orcs probably weren't chill you know they weren't chill they weren't chill like that so we probably didn't hang out with them <laughs> and you got black hole guns so they're like you want a daca and it's like flump i yeah they probably didn't enjoy fighting humans at the time because there's no you know uh charging into a, a basically a wall of guns with uh you know melee weapons essentially <laughs> this hasn't happened yet so at the uh, height of this time, it's basically humanity's golden age. We are almost, in a way, uh, unchallenged in technology and science. The Emperor, unfortunately, he's not really doing much, but him and other perpetuals he's discovered over the years, um, they sort of... They, they've created like a cult, shall we say. I don't know if they don't necessarily like all... an exclusive club. <laughs> yeah, pretty much like, you know... <laughs> they, ha, are you a, uh, can you join the club? It's like, oh, what do I have to do? And they just like stab you in the chest and then you're like, ow. Oh yeah, yeah he's fine. Yeah, let him in. If he don't come back, <laughs> he's lying. <laughs> so mm-hmm. they very much have like a, you know, they got their clique together. And these this cult of perpetuals, uh, they sort of suit up for a mission that only perpetuals can do. And they reach a world called Moloch. And this world is really important within Warhammer. And the reason why Neoth, or the Emperor, the man who would one day become the Emperor, he only had perpetuals with him, was because they were traveling in a ship that was not faster than light travel. So it had to be crewed by essentially immortal people that wouldn't die of old age. 
And Indeed. as they've reached this kind of very strange world of Moloch, I'll pass it over to Andy to tell you what exactly went down on this uh, strange place. Well, this is this is the um, what you could call the ascendance of the emperor's might, where he he he, he basically enters a, a warp gate, and he's in there for a few moments, and then when he comes out, his psychic powers have just been like cranked up to you know 115 out of 10. He's essentially got you know he's like the most powerful being in humanity in like snap of a finger. And when he's in the the warp gate and he goes into the immaterium place, I suppose you'd call it, um, he also gets like a kind of a lore dump of like something incredibly probably important and very difficult to digest information. <laughs> Let's put it that way. Uh, like imagine if you were like watch every one of our channels, all the videos in half a second and you divulged all the information, but you also knew like everything we'd ever done in our lives and, you know, the postcodes of everywhere in I don't know Mozambique. And, you you poor know, soul. All, all this information. Like, <laughs> where, where did all this information come? I don't know. It's a bit much. It's a bit much. It's a bit much. And um, for some reason, uh, well, no one knows what he actually saw in there, but it changed him completely. Like his personality just dropped off a cliff um, to the point where Erda, the perpetual, even comments about how. Well, the emperor used to have a sense of, sense of humor, and now he he doesn't laugh anymore. He do, he's he's just very stern, very stoic, very, mm. and it's like it's like such a, a an incredible shift in his personality, um, to which we could probably speculate that that's the moment where he started to give less of a care for uh, humanity in some regards because he lost a lot of his human traits. So I think it's quite a. I like the fact that Erda when we do meet Erda in the Warhammer books, I, it's so like hilarious to me that she actually says the Emperor was really funny before because you have to Im imagine, like, is his sense of humour like really outdated and it's something that only the perpetuals get being like, <laughs> they, like they, do they make only like i don't know what happened in like you are know are you inferring that the comedy that the uh the comedy stylings of the emperor were not woke is that what it's more slap <laughs> is it like slapstick do i like you know do, you know he like falls over like oh i tripped and he's just or does he make like you know step you know stepbrother jokes i don't know what he does mm. but i think uh the idea of him being like his humor being old to me at least is hilarious I think it was President Truman that had like this auto or this aquatic car that could drive into lakes, and he would sometimes <laughs> pretend that uh, he was losing control of his car and just dive into a lake when like dignitaries <laughs> were visiting with him. Uh, I like to imagine like the emperor would just do that regularly, be like I'm losing control, like that kind of stuff. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, so he very much um, so. You know, all that, all his funny, let's see, his funny bone was removed uh, as soon as he entered this massive uh, warp rift gate. And, you know, he didn't, he didn't come out the same. Let's just say that. And he kind of, after this, we return a little bit towards the species entirely. So humanity, again, we're sort of, we're, you know, we're trudging along. We sort of reach to the 22nd millennium. And this is where the STC, it's the standard template construct. Many of us who, uh, we all run law channels. I'm pretty sure this is like a, oh, this is a massive moment within the law because the STC is an incredibly complex piece of technology and it's kind of unique uh, thing is that it contains uh, thousands upon thousands of blueprints. And the, the reason why it's so useful is because anyone who owns an STC can simply just input resources into the standard template construct, and then the STC will manufacture uh, whatever you desire, as long as you have, say, you know, you put, it's literally like, I guess, video games in a way. So you put in like, you know, mm. iron, wood, and it's like, oh, here you go, here's plasma gun. I like so, the idea of like, just having a massive funnel and you just like put in like iron or <laughs> like gunpowder and just like, I want to make a bolt and you're just cramming it in this big funnel and <laughs> coming out the other side like a sausage. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine that probably some, there's probably some very cursed stuff as well. Like, you know, oh, I, I don't know if they had like a standard com like blueprint for a, uh, let's say anime body pillow, but they had, <laughs> but let's just say they had, yep. 
<laughs> they had every, it's not, it's go not ahead. Hard to name Miku SDC. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so they essentially have everything a colony would need uh, is con- is contained within like these kind of like core devices. So they are extremely uh, important and incredible. I mean, if we owned one, like humanity now would just basically be unstoppable. And each and each colony has essentially one of these. So it's a it's a massive boon uh, for humanity across the stars. So as we progress a little bit further, uh, we are. It's not actually an empire of humanity, but it's a federation. So it's a collection of many different groups. But humanity itself, maybe there was like some civil strife, but it's not mentioned. But it's definitely not ruled in the same way that the 40th millennium is under one person. And with our utter mastery of technology in this golden age, we made a bad choice and we decided we will develop AI in tandem with this, you know, incredible technology. So we kind of... The SDCs were going so well, so you're like, right, what what could go wrong? This is great. Surely whatever else we make will be great. Yeah, we're we're not sure why, you know, know, what could go wrong is the famous last words (laughs) for many people. So... It, back in the early 20th millennium, there were kind of the earliest versions of these AI devices called the Men of Stone. And they were like the first kind of foray into AI. They are they are inferred to be sort of more machines and tools for like kind of everyday human needs. They're like assisting ones. But these Men of Stone eventually will create and were the first iteration of what would be known as the Men of Iron. And unfortunately, as a reference here, they're pretty much, if anyone here, they're basically Terminators. Uh, We're not going to, you know, even though there are Necrons in Warhammer, it's basically Terminators. We've also uh, thought it was really important to let you guys know we made a good uh, reference here of, come with me if you want to live. (laughs) And then we also have, because it makes sense, you know, get to the chopper. (laughs) Because Arnie is here. Unfortunately, Arnie's not in this age, but um, we're essentially... We we made Terminators. I'm pretty sure everyone has to like uh, scrub their brain from what they just heard there. <laughs> Unfortunately, those movies did not exist in the Warhammer timeline. Otherwise, people mm. would have known better. Or they might have, but it's like it maybe became like full circle, and then like the robots are the main characters, and then like the humans. Are, like, <laughs> oh my god! You never know. Um, so essentially, yeah, we done we done goofed it, the official term, and <laughs> we made AI. And of course, the men of iron are essentially in, within the Warhammer uh, verse itself. They are actually sentient, so they have their own thoughts and their own feelings. Defi- this is a part where it gets difficult to say: Would you define them as alive? Because again, that's I guess uh, this is the Alan Turing test, isn't it? This is a bit of a tricky thing. We're not really sure, but in the Warhammer universe, they are very much. Uh, sentient beings and of course when you have sentience you have problems so uh, if anyone wants to put, put on a t-shirt by the way uh, they're welcome <laughs> to use that quote uh, sentience equals problems and so the men of gold they refer to which is humans so the masters we were the creators we uh, they decide we're not good masters anymore so they revolt and this is called the cybernetic revolt, and it literally, because it's AI, obviously machines are usually connected to each other, you know, particularly with our internet as well. You know, we're obviously four different people connected over, you know, you know, different places. So, you know. If we if we woke up tomorrow and all of our, like, iPhones or smartphones weren't working, like, ever again, it'd just be over. We'd be like, no, what's the point? <laughs> you sort of so, shut, shut that, the- And that's now. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. So everyone, everyone couldn't access TikTok anymore. It was a very sad day. <laughs> so, so uh, this literally explodes aqua- ac- across the Federation of Mankind, like almost probably within an instant. Uh, or how it depends how quick the uh, f- you know the uh, internet speeds are in each realm. And the this war is titanic. It is on every single human world, and it was so dangerous shall we say that this is where the xenos such as the orcs and also our giga chads the eldari i think colin might want to enjoy this yeah Yeah. so the eldari uh 
actually ally with humanity. Uh, surprisingly, the orcs do. Um, I think it might... I speculate uh, that it may be humanity when, yo, there's an enemy that you could crunk. Uh, really, you know, you could crunk that guy and it'd be really fun. And they probably went, yeah, that sounds fun. So, yeah, it's, oh, it, we've it, never it, fought it, them before. Cracks knuckles. They, 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 they just pointed them in that direction. Like, hey, orcs, big guy. And <laughs> that's all they just needed went, to do. Orcs smash and they went and then they ran <laughs> i guess i just think um the idea of orcs that they have diplomacy at the time is still utterly hilarious but apparently they did so mm. the orcs you know they, they they're like you know we're in essentially and this war to as positive as i made it sound this war is awful <laughs> so this war is so bad it literally scars humanity like to this day and ai so artificial intelligence is banned. It's not allowed because, again, it's literally the worst thing that apparently is the worst thing that ever happens to us. And it's rebranded, sorry, rebranded to abominable intelligence. A little bit dicey, a little bit, huh? A bit heavy on that. Mm. And we were having a discussion though. We weren't sure what scale it would be in comparison to um, like the Horus Heresy because mm. I was like, I understand that the 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 reference is it's so bad it literally kind of opened the door for the warp to cause a bit more mischief and it ruined humanity's progress and stuff. But I'm also like, well, Horus Heresy was pretty bad as well, and it you know it, it, it again it 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 put like the last nail in the coffin for humanity in a lot of ways. So I was we, we were having a we weren't quite sure how it stacked up to it. We were wondering if you guys maybe thought it might have been worse than the Heresy. What do you guys think? Uh, I think it was probably worse just because everyone helped to stop it, whereas the other races... Well, I mean, Horus Heresy was a different time, I guess. No one wants to help the humans after the Great Crusade. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can't imagine that made them friends. <laughs> yeah. It does seem worse, though. It does seem more on like a... Like, the full galaxy had to be involved, not just the humans. And it was our fault as well. So, you know, <laughs> we, we can't, who do we blame but ourselves? And so humanity is just, you know, AI is essentially gone and we have to learn to evolve to not use it. So this is where we get the disgusting kind of grim, dark meshing of human and machine. So servitors, I think everyone, maybe if you, like, if you guys remember, like when you first get into Warhammer, do you remember seeing like servitors yeah. or like hearing about them? You kind of go, that is awful. I think. I just remember the cherubs yeah. being like, "What is that?" Oh, yeah, yeah, that was. It's shocking, so, isn't it? They're so great for Warhammer setting, though. They make it so. Uh, yeah. E like, yeah. Oh, oh, cherubs! Oh, they're great. Like, <laughs> yeah, Eli has got some strange tendencies. Man. I'm, I'm all about the grim dark. I'm all about the grim dark of Warhammer. It's awesome. You remind me of like um, is there one, this is this is gonna be the, the reference of like no one will get this but it was like uh you know they make parodies of films like a scary movie or something like that but there's mm -hmm. one where they had like alvin and the chipmunks in it and there's a ref <laughs> i don't know what film it's meant to be a parody of but the alvin and the chipmunks are really cute but they also say like really awful stuff and that reminds me of like you <laughs> lie a little bit because <laughs> because <laughs> they're like oh they're so nice they're like we're gonna rev out your spine and it's like oh no <laughs> uh well when you look at a servitor you're just like it's the perfect embodiment of what warhammer is that's you know? true, yeah, true. Like sanctity of life. Pfft, what? No, thank yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. This, yeah. It's a it's like it's just a nice little reminder of a Warhammer is when the art and stuff nowadays is kind of losing grip of Yeah, it's a little bit the, more how clean. Dark it was. Yeah. Yeah. It's got it's got like a weird mix of it's not cyberpunk, but it's got like it's obviously more advanced than our technology, but it's also kind of barbaric in its implementation. Mm. It's got that nice aesthetic to it. Dehumanizing. Uh, feeling to it well speaking of dehumanizing <laughs> we move on to the next stage in humanity's story so uh humanity essentially survives the war uh you know we did it we made it through but we're not really the same and this is where we kind of reach to the 24th millennium and this is where a figure who would one day be called malkador the sigilite is born and yeah, that's my boy that's yeah my boss. I think uh, I put in these notes that it's important to stress he only got a short millennium. Malkador is also <laughs> uh, speculated to be a pe perpetual. And he's a very important character in uh, the birth of the Imperium, as we will see later. But he basically 
Malkador arrives. Humanity's just survived like the worst war it ever gets. And then he basically has a millennia to enjoy this time. And then it's about to get worse. <laughs> so yeah. he, he doesn't really get a good deal, if you know what I mean. Whereas the emperor who's still around, he's still in the background of um, what's been going on. Obviously, he saw the cool stuff. You know, he got to see uh, Warhammer World when it was mentioned. <laughs> over here. So it, the emperor was around. And um, so this is unfortunately, we get to the end of the 24th millennium and we've reached the, thought, the 25th millennium era. And this is where, I'm so sorry, Colin, but due to the decadence of the Eldari, a storm in the warp was it brewing. It, it happened. I can't Let's deny it. Eyes. Would you like to, just for uh, a brief explanation about uh, how, f if, if you could give a quick summary, Colin, about how tragic you feel about how much the Eldari have fallen, just to really give it some uomph uh, for the listener. 20 out of 10, very tragic, uh, falling from unri unchallenged, unrivaled dominance to <laughs> not not that. Not, just <laughs> not. <laughs> just not having that. It's, uh, yeah, it's credibly, uh, it's, it's bad news, let's just say. Um, so we put uh, in brackets, by the way, a storm was brewing. You're a you're a wizard, Harry, because you know a storm was brewing, and Hagrid was. I don't know why I put this there, but I, I think I remembered it later. <laughs> but yeah, I don't. Know, I think it was a storm was brewing. It's like you're a wizard, Harry, because uh, it reminded me of Hagrid's voice. So imagine <laughs> imagine Hagrid was narrating that the Eldaria decadent. Uh, so yeah. enjoy that tidbit. Harry, Harry Potter is just going to seep its way into all of our videos. Huh? It's, it's going to, mm. I watch it every year uh, for Christmas. So it's, nice. it's coming up. So warp storms <laughs> just start to, let's just say, I like the image of, you know how you put ink in water and it starts to slowly spread out and let's just say dye the rest of the uh, pureness around it. The warp storms are, start to ravage uh, across the galaxy any and the humanity itself they can only really maintain this like interstellar i guess the the ashes of this uh, interstellar federation by doing warp travel because luckily travel in the warp is um i hate to use this analogy but like minecraft isn't it if it all goes to the ender yeah. not the ender um is it the, the ender the nether? nether sorry the nether. nether in minecraft how you can travel further in the nether so it's like the warp is a bit shorter in distance for some reason and so communication and travel is completely just shut down and this is really the last nail in the coffin for humanity and essentially it just like we collapse at like, you know, worlds are cut off and it's just kind of everyone's on their own. Maybe you're lucky if you can be within range of some planets, but essentially everyone is just like, we're done. And this is the sad part for Andy. I'm very sorry for this bit, but for 3000 years, humanity starts to regress. The golden age has passed. Technological understanding is poor. War and civil strife is just everywhere over the scraps of just what, what's what been left of like our best times. And r this is sort of where religion and faith starts to return to humanity. It's implied that it kind of, this is again, a little bit of speculation, but it's implied that it sort of uh, faded away maybe within the early millenniums of humanity. So I guess well, we're in the second millennium and then it sort of would between now and what was essentially the golden age it sort of faded away and this is the time where i guess it's so awful and life is just sucks <laughs> let's be honest it just sucks mm. and this is where like you start to see across many like numerous different worlds where humanity uh, reside it starts to return on a certain scale and this kind of slow decline is pretty much you know we all know where it's going at this point if you're part of humanity, you just kind of know that the best days are behind us. But not everyone agrees with that. So on the war-scarred hellscape of terror, a figure reveals himself to the galaxy. This is the emperor of mankind. So Big E decides, no, not, you know, not on my watch or something. So, you know, he gets a, he used to stand up and he makes a, I guess, sorry, makes a stand, shall we say. So, but this is not easy, shall we say. So, Terra 
the big emperor, big emperor, the big E, <laughs> the, big emperor. the big daddy, his full title on his, his passport, the, the big daddy emperor. Um, he is, okay. he's on, ter- <laughs> well, let's not go there, shall we? Uh, mm-hmm. he is on terror when, uh, this is all collapsed and terror at this time, uh, as we said in the beginner section is dominated by various techno barbarian warlords, warmongers, leaders of like strange, weird cults and, I think I put at the end selfish individuals just because I wanted to <laughs> just explain that they are like very much they're in for themselves. It's kind of like um, is anyone here? People who would cut into a queue and you're like, excuse me, uh, oh, that's the, the worst. Back of the lines over there, and they're like, absolute heresy. Oh, I'm gonna go here, aren't I? I'm just gonna you, skip the queue. And you're like, oh, you're the worst. You can't do that in the UK. <laughs> that's that's just like warranting a death stare from everyone. <laughs> I think. Um, I think a lot of people have made the analogy like this is kind of like Mad Max. Is anyone here a fan of like Mad yeah. Max stuff like that? It's kind of a bit of a uh, nod to that, shall we say? So we, we've covered a lot of different <laughs> influences from different universes. So we're we're in Mad Max era right now, and you're probably wondering where has the Emperor been? Like where? Why is he not uh, made his big presence known earlier? Because obviously he's old, shall we say? He's he's uh, immortal, and that's because the emperor himself has been working on a secret project. Uh, he currently, at this time, resides in little hidden laboratories in the Himalayan mountains. And this is where, let's just say, he's been cooking. He's been cooking up a plan to, uh, you know, he, <laughs> they all make say, um, who was the guy with the frosted tips, by the way? In, uh, <laughs> uh, what's his guy name? Ferrari? Guy Ferrari? Oh. Yeah, Guy Ferrari or something like that. He, uh, he's been cooking. <laughs> well, what's his catchphrase? Oh. What's uh, his catchphrase, uh, Guy Fieri? Colin, please. Yum, yum, yum. It's flavor time. It's flavor time. Yeah. So, yeah. So, the Emperor. <laughs> the Emperor. Dec- <laughs> Town or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, um, I don't know, welcome to Flavor Town, is it? Something like that. But, so uh, the, some, I don't, something like that. So, the, so, the Emperor, this is not canon, but it's in my head. The Emperor says it's Flavor Time or Flavor Town or Time to Take It to Flavor Town, whatever you like. And he unleashes many morbs all over the place. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh god! So he uh, unleashes his a millennia long plan that he was creating in secret. So in the Himalayan mountains, you know, in the snow, armies begin to march forth, filled with mortals and engineered super soldiers. This is also uh, at the kind of end of the 28th millennium this is where we meet the character constantine valdor so he is the first emperor's custodian uh he's a very very cool character i did a, a mm. shameless plug by the way i did a cool video on him if you want to check that out okay. <laughs> thank you watch it. thank you and um we'll, we'll probably tackle him in a another separate video but he's essentially as andy said in the beginning section custodian's like a, a handcrafted like specialized super soldier. It's implied that mm. the emperor remakes them on the molecular level. And yet there's also something else to that process. So it's- and, and Valdor in particular is also arguably as strong as a Primarch as the like main custodian. A lot of people are like, Oh, he can like, he's pretty even match for Primarch. And that's without all the weird warp. He, uh, uh, he supposedly duels. Yes. He's dueled a couple of them. I think it states mm. that he managed to, the first time he fought Rogel Dawn in a duel, he managed to beat Rogel Dawn, but that was implied that because Valdor was essentially a centuries-long experienced warrior and Dawn had just been found by the Emperor. So it's kind mm. of like a cool little part to show you, but then apparently he never beat him again after that. So, you know, <laughs> it'd be difficult. He'd like, eh, probably it would, not. It would take quite a few custodians, but the custodians are, that's how strong they are. Like they could take on a, you know, a, a demigod figure essentially. And, uh, with these sort of specialized soldiers, there are also, uh, sorry, just backtrack a little bit because I find this, I love this part of the uh, Constantine Valdor book. It's implied that when they first start out, the uh, forces of the emperor, they're mostly scientists and they essentially don't have much. So when they set out to like conquer terror, they literally say that they started in like simple steels and like leathers and they had kind of mix and match equipment and every time they kind of defeated an enemy they sort of slapped on pieces they stole like powered armor and guns but they have like really like valdor even states in uh part of his book that they literally began with 
just whatever they could find and then it yeah, kind but, but of he didn't invest in insurance for his stcs which <laughs> is a bit of a shame yeah so he, it was a very humble i say humble beginning because it's filled with like demigod powered characters but they very mm. much they had to build everything as they were going but there's also another force shall we say that fought alongside these uh mortals and custodians i'll pass over to andy just to give a little brief look into who these uh, strange things were as as good as the um custodians are the emperor knew he didn't really have enough to do a, a full-scale war you know his custodians are important he doesn't want to waste them like getting mowed down by like massive amounts of you know if a, if a custodian can fight a thousand people and just about survive fair enough but he doesn't want to like take a hundred of his custodians or a thousand and sacrifice them. So he develops these Thunder Warriors, and they are they are more powerful than Astartes. These guys are huge, lumbering, genetically um, engineered, basically like walking tank men. And they were they were designed by uh, a, a genius scientist known as Amar Astarte, and the name is important there because she would also go on to, to develop the Astartes, as is their namesake. Uh, they were mass-produced, so... They um and, and and the thing was they were never designed to leave Terra. Like the reason they had like open helm designed armor, they had greaves with like bits missing where there were weak points. They weren't designed to be unstoppable. They were designed to get the job done. You know, savage the enemy, cut them to bits. Absolute brutality and barbarism unleashed on the enemies of the Emperor in like bronze armor. Um, a good thing to check out, which I'm sure if you're listening to this pop podcast you probably already know um the last church written by graham mcneil mm. uh, there was a team that made an animated uh version of it called uh, apocalypsis i believe it is and it was created by a chap i'm gonna butcher his name i think uh tiber tiber portuguese or portuguese mm. who, who wrote it animated by tony cesar and composed by aaron weatherford and although the original video was taken down by a games workshop i think you can still watch it on the Kill Team Hungary YouTube channel. So it's worth checking out. It's worth a watch. And that animation will detail the events in very, very crisp detail um, of the rise of the Thunder Warriors and the the uh, the, the, the onslaught they brought to Terra. I think uh, that animation... Has everyone here uh, seen that, by the way? I saw most of it. Colin? I have read the book, though. I haven't seen all of it. Uh, but I've uh, watched a decent bit of it, and it, I I cannot recommend it enough. It is it's actually I would consider it one of the if you didn't know what Warhammer was and you watched that that would straight send you like straight into the deep end because it's so um, nothing crazy nothing you know defining happens in it, but it's in terms of like you know big set piece battles something like that, but. It has such a important well, moment. I, I, think. I do like that bit where it's like this huge army of techno barbarians, and they're like charging towards this line of thunder warriors, and they're trying to shoot at them, but they're too far away. Their guns don't reach. They start charging, and then the warriors just go volley, and it just rips through them. Oh, it's and then they haunting. Decimate them. Yeah, it's. So, I'll go ahead. So go. See the the last church, both like the video and the stores it's also just cool because it shows you can have a good warhammer store without needing like huge constant, budget all, yeah mm -hmm. they're just balls to the wall action the whole time yeah like it's, and in the, the any Xenos either. It's, yeah. it's pretty good it doesn't have any space marines <laughs> as well it doesn't have a, a single space I'm gonna, marine ironically i'm gonna move on from the provocations well te <laughs> technically there is a space marine at the very end with the garvio loca t uh Loken t's right at the end at the post credits but still I actually don't think I saw that part. So he caught me out. Ooh. That's good. That's good. There. Um, it doesn't it doesn't rely on them? They don't need to do what no. the yeah. stories usually do and throw in Marines every five minutes. It's just like, hey, this is a cool story. There's very little action, but it's still an excellent read. Mm -hmm. I love it for that. So speaking of the last church, so the th the thunder warriors the custodians and the mortal armies of the emperor they've pretty much i guess i don't want to say crushed because that's not big enough they've crunked like the the yeah. people of terror they you know they've Decimated. they've randy orton slithering out and they've <laughs> they've rko'd onto paste they very much uh terror is pretty much theirs they've crushed they crushed many like big forces there's a notable 
uh, enemy called uh, Mollard Sen, who's famously a like evil priest king who the emperor actually met early on in his life. And there's kind of a nice hint there about they kind of knew this day would come. So there's, mm. there's a lot of sort of famous names that essentially get ticked off the list. But as the emperor's kind of united terror, he makes one last stop, shall we say. And this is where the emperor, uh, as we've mentioned, the last church animation, he visits the last church upon terror and he meets with the priest named Uriah. Now, we'll be a little bit sensitive here because we're not here to render judgment or anything like that, but we're here to kind of show that, I guess, the, the conversation they have has uh, merit within both of them. Both so, of them have like oh, really interesting points which undercurrent and undermine each other. There's no, there's like, there's no, I wouldn't say there is like a clear, ah, I'm right and you're wrong. They both have elements of like, especially in the setting, like, ah, mm -hmm. I, I, I suppose one is more harsh and cold and calculated, whereas one is more emotional, but also filled with hope. And so there's, there's an interesting dynamic in their discussion. Definitely. And I think, um, so to uh, spoilers for the last church animation, we'll say it here. But um, so in a brief summary, the emperor himself kind of goes into detail uh, speaking with Uriah. They kind of it's about the intricacies of Uriah's own faith, which is um, built upon many different stories that he holds like very dear to his heart. And you can see like the like Uriah himself has led a very difficult life, but he kind of. He had a very like troubled and he wasn't a very good person in the beginning, but he finds this place and it kind of accumulates to the point where the emperor, when he's first approached Uriah, he was, you know, disguising himself. But at some point he decides enough and he actually reveals himself as the, you know, the glorious, the golden wreathed in golden armor, shining psychic dominant man, the emperor of mankind. And unfortunately, with this kind of revelation, Uriah realizes that the faith that he had been serving, his like church, it was all built upon fables and let's just say people remembering stories about the emperor himself. So you even see mm -hmm. it in parts where like things on like the ceiling are like depicting, as we mentioned earlier, the emperor fighting the dragon of Mars and things like that. So. Mm -hmm. This church is kind of built upon something that's not really the faith that Uriah has in his heart. And it's obviously a bit, a bit I found that really sad, that part, because it's like, mm. damn, you know what I mean? And even Uriah, like his most crystallizing moment in his like faith is when he thought he met, he met God. And then he realized that he met the emperor on the battlefield 50 years ago, appearing mm. just as he does before him, you know, gold shimmering his put l'oreal on his hair because he's worth it you know what i mean it's like all flowing <laughs> and but there's a nice part of this because even though i would this is a little bit of speculation here, uh here sorry uh, which is uriah is he realizes that his faith is not true in the sense like you know what's written down in the book is not you know it's he can obviously see in front of his eyes it's not the truth of it but everything he did because of his faith, he did, um, it ended up being like a really good thing. Like he helped people, he cared for people, you know, the sick and the dying. And he's led a really good life because he believed. And even if what he believed in was a lie, the belief itself, I think, was real. I think that's a really touching moment because it's saying, mm. you know, isn't, he didn't, his, his God didn't have to be real for him to lead a good life because of what was written in uh, his faith. And uh, that's kind of where he, you know, puts a middle finger up to the emperor and he says, you know, even if it's not real, mm. I still did, I still did all that. That was me. Yeah. And I, because I believed it, it was real. And then he kind of, he doesn't want to live in the future where there's almost no, uh, that where there's not people like who can, who, where humanity itself is not allowed to do the things he has just done now and so therefore mm. he walks into the burning uh, the emperor's burning the church down and uriah That's walks into one. it and he uh, he defy he literally defies the godlike mm -hmm. emperor ironically you know the emperor not claiming to be a god but yet he's so godlike in his power but uriah turns away and he literally holds to his faith all the way to the end and it's a very uh i think it's a very nice uh 
it's a very well written piece and it's a very nice moment. I don't know. Did you guys? I don't know if everyone else here had the same interpretation of that story. If they walked away with that, what do you uh, think, Colin? I'll ask Eli after. I think I don't know. Something I always come back to when I think about it is that Uriah is not a priest. He's said there's almost been like called to his faith, but mm. he's not trained as a priest. He's not ordained. So. I'd like to imagine that if the Emperor argued with an actual ordained priest instead of shooting them in the face, he'd be even more on the losing front. <laughs> and uh, Eli, what do you, how do you think when you came away from that uh, story? It's been a long time since I read it, but yeah, I, I did really like it. I do really like it, because uh, I don't know how to say it correctly. I don't know, I think the Emperor has very... Well, the Emperor's a liar. He lied to everyone. And I mean, it depends on how you see it, but... The Emperor knows gods do exist, but I guess in Warhammer it's a perspective, kind of like how Fabius sees it, of if they are gods or if they're just really strong things. There's a coalition of emotions Indeed. in the warp. They're not, like, Indeed. real. Yeah, so the um, we see. Also, go ahead, sorry. Sorry. But we see people time and time again going back to seeing the Emperor as a god, even Lorgar, his primarch, uh... I mean, he's not, it would seem, but it gets to the point where he's at such status and such power that calling him a god is not that far off. Mm. And, I mean, we see how him rejecting it entirely and not telling people of the supernatural really bites him in the end and ruins it for everyone. He definitely, with Lorgar yeah. in particular, he's got the weird parallel of he grew up on a planet where there was worship, and you know mm -hmm. his, his adoptive father was a, a clergyman of, of a form of faith, and it ruined mm -hmm. his legion's trajectory. And it's like, ah, but that's what the emperor was talking about. And it's like, ooh, okay, ooh. Also, as, no, a, I think as, soon, as soon as boulders are introduced, there's like no time for talking anymore. It's like, right, something's happening, and it's not going to be good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think also, as Major Kill says, he's also... Um, Logar's bald, so therefore you know he's going to end up as a, <laughs> the bad guys. Absolutely fine when he had a head of hair, and then bald, evil. There's something mm -hmm. about Warhammer and bald. The bald guys yes. always end up <laughs> on the uh, even the evil side. Fulgrim lost all of his like skin and limbs and was reborn as a big snake, and even he still had luscious locks and yeah. he was evil, but he looked better. But he's pretty, a very pretty boy indeed. And uh, <laughs> I think. Uh, said, though. Oh, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Colin. And I know it's jumping ahead, but even Gilman, now that he's back, is starting to think maybe Lorgar had a point. Yep. Mm. I mean, the entire... In, in the end, Lorgar did win the heresy. Like, the... the their, the imperial even if Gorak text, was outside his door Philip, like scratching it, at it, 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 it <laughs> let me in <laughs> let me in <laughs> yeah the religious was, text though that the imperium follows is literally the book of Lorgar like he won the metaphorical he, he, he won he the, won the philosophical the philosophical 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 there we go he won the philosophical he, dental he, hygiene award he won the philosophical war yeah unless you you could also subscribe to the idea that the emperor orchestrated the entire heresy so that he could become a god and one day destroy the chaos gods that's a theory i guess but well we we'll had sucker to... punch nurgle recently so that was quite good mm -hmm. that was enjoyable i think um what the reason uh, just before we move on just to the if we're wrapping up, shall we say, the uh, birth of the Imperium. The reason that the Emperor burns the last church on terror is because as he, uh, sort of the foundation of its uh, Imperium is beginning, the this is say the, the thing that lies at the heart of the Imperium is called the Imperial Truth. And this is a set of like, I don't know if it's to say atheistic beliefs, because it's a bit more than that, but it's essentially mm. a worldview. Uh, sorry, go ahead, Andy. I know the kind of catchphrase is there are no gods in the earth or in the sky. That's like a, a saying that is part of the imperial truth. It's a sort of uh, doctrine that's about, I think in a way it was meant to be designed as a, we're returning, trying to return to how people saw the universe in the golden age of humanity. So there's a sort of emphasis on there are no gods, there are no stories and fables there's only reason mm. science that basically science is the only truth essentially and they wanted to create uh 
Well, the, the reason that the emperor does this will definitely be tackled, I think, as we get further on into the uh, Imperium story, because it's it's a, definitely a big reveal in the end. And like as uh, Eli said, there's some obviously hypocrisy involved, which you know, as Warhammer fans, we love a bit of hypocrisy in the law, not outside the law, but in the law. Uh, so uh, we'll definitely tackle the emperor's reasons for this kind of atheistic uh, doctrine that he starts to spread, and. With the last church, unfortunately, and poor Uriah uh, burned, uh, terror is essentially unified and everything is under the, I would say hand, but I mean like the iron grip of the emperor. And the emperor at this time sort of forms a, I think it's described in the books as a triumvirate. So similar to, uh, shout out a bit of history here if everyone enjoys that. So the triumvirate is obviously taken from, the time of, uh, you know, when Augustus Caesar, uh, he was obviously not called Augustus at the time, but um, him, Mark Antony, and do, do you know the other third person in the triumvirate columns? I know you enjoy your Roman history. Uh, off the top of my head, I'm afraid. Oh, well, I'm, uh, it's all right. We'll, we'll, we'll get someone to comment it, I'm sure. But there's, um, uh, <laughs> I'll, let, I'll leave that gonna, for you. This is going to piss me. I'm gonna, gonna, I'm, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry I brought it up. At the end of the podcast or the next one, we'll be doing a completely different subject. And he'll be like, it's so and so. Ah, sorry. Go back to the old one. <laughs> Crassus. Crassus. So it was Julius Caesar, Pompey, and Crassus. Oh, that's, that's the oh, first man. the first triumvirate, isn't it? I'm thinking of the one with Mark Antony oh, after. Oh, never mind. That's yeah. So that Antony, was Lepidus and Octavian. I'm, so, I'm sorry, so, I couldn't let that one sit. <laughs> that's all good. All good. So this is the uh, they form a triumvirate on terror. We're at the essentially 29th millennium now, and I think I remember the word they use in the book for it was because there was. One was the king, one was the sorcerer, and one was the warrior. I think they describe it. So the emperor, obviously, being the singular, it's described as the singular vision at the heart. It's the famous words of the emperor. And Malkador, obviously, being a thousand year old perpetual. He's a very mysterious kind of advisory figure. He looks like an old man, but he might. I don't know if it's described if he's an actual perpetual. But he, I, think, I think he is. It's just a case of like he puts on a, a, a he projects to the world that look in order to like, ha- have that that kind of to old have man judge weakness. Him as such. Yeah. He, he looks like an old yeah, man, he, yeah. And yeah. I think um, there's a there's a funny point, isn't there, in the law where him and Constantine Valdor, the custodian, they both run at the same pace at some point. So so obviously Val, uh, Malkador is not weak, but so mm-hmm. Malkador is like a elderly perpetual. Uh, figure shall we say but we'll tackle him again in a uh, another video and Valdor who's the first custodian so they are the triumvirate on terror and they start laying the groundwork for the next stage which is now that terror's together and they've used the thunder warriors you know the brutal the awful uh you know just I guess maniacs that are the thunder warriors they they are not fit for a war in the stars. And so they uh, create a plan to exterminate all these, all these warriors who had fought for the emperor and they just like basically backstab them. And after this is done, uh, Constantine Valdor finds himself confronted by one of the high lords of terror. This is a figure called uh, Awoma Kandawire. She's kind of like an elderly... Um, stateswoman i guess but it's kind of it's implied that she confronts valdor and she creates a plan with like kind of the surviving thunder warriors that were not uh decimated that she's trying to fight for an imperium that's almost like a democratic and accountable imperium imperium where like the emperor doesn't get to do what he wants and no fun. yeah so she's kind of you know what would happen in our world to be honest, would that kind of future would probably be fought for, but in Warhammer, it doesn't obviously, well, we you know, sell resin models with guns. So, <laughs> so, so this is, um, it doesn't go her way, unfortunately. And there's a really awesome scene, which is it describes how, like, she like stands before Valdor and the thund- like, Thunder Warriors behind her, and Valdor stands alone. And he just looks at them all and he just basically behind him in the mist, it says like 10,000 helm flares ignite. And it's basically 
the adept as a starty start to march forward. So the space marines are here and they've been created in secret away from like the knowledge of the high lords. Again, an, an unaccountable force to the emperor. And they're the dark angels because they're the first legion or the, the proto dark angels. Yeah, and they, they yeah, there's a really cool part where it describes how the thunder warriors fight like bears, but the yeah. space marines oh, fight I like wolves. Ushatan. I like I love um, Ushatan, who's like the uh, the the primarch of the thunder warriors, who's like not a primarch primarch, but he's like in the t- the title is like, the title primarch, and he's like he's he's fighting and Baldor's fighting and you know he's killing these space marines. He's like Baldor, these new warriors fight like they're constipated, and I was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Great line. Is a uh, Usha Tan's like the last kind of leader of all. He has the title Primarch, so that's the reason, obviously, why Primarch gets used later in the uh, Warhammer lore. And essentially, they get slaughtered. And Mm. it's a Valdor. I think even at that point, they're not really like they're not upset with the Thunder War. They think they did the good service, but they're just not. Mm. They're not what's needed because. Uh, the Imperium is going to encompass humanity and therefore Thunder Warriors unfortunately don't belong in that vision. And so we kind of get to basically the last stage of the birth of the Imperium here. So I think it stated that the Adeptus Astartes themselves, they were created from, quote, new generals. And obviously we'll be talking about them a lot in the Warhammer. So if you stay tuned, they'll be coming up quite a bit. And uh, these were new, so these Astartes were created from the gene seed, so specialised like, vat-grown organs from these quote-unquote new generals, uh, Primarchs basically, and they were much more stable. They were a little bit smaller, a little bit weaker than Thunder Warriors. I think we said that before, but they were obviously Just a little. They they weren't they weren't as like yeah crazy. The trade-off with the Thunder Warriors, they were big, they were bulky, but yeah, fail safes to make sure that they didn't last too long. And this was actually, they had to be, the reason they were created in secret was because like with the, uh, at this time with the emperor, the reason he created these new generals was because over the years, even we could probably say since he left the gate of Moloch uh, many millennia ago, the perpetuals around him, they didn't see that the same man they decided to follow. And like, they all started to leave his side over the years. And so this is why he created these new generals, I guess. I think this might be my own theory. Like he also created them because he wanted people to relate to, but that might be like a kind of, you know, in the background is not a conscious thought sort of thing. Just my own theory there. But so even like Amar Astarte, who helped, you know, the genius geneticist, she even betrays him as well. Like he's constantly gets betrayed by people who start to realize like, oh, he's like, He's not sharing any of this. He he means to put himself at the head of everything. And these Adeptus Astartes, which the, I think the funny part is, even after her betrayal, he still likes to call them Astartes. And it's implied that he has a, I think Malkador says he has a very, even now he still has a very strange sense of humor. He's obviously not funny, <laughs> but I think he like he enjoys the joke that the person who thought he would fail and who betrayed him, he essentially has warriors named after these failures. And obviously they go, wow. no, it does he come, you know. as much of a sense of humor as Luther calling him Lionel Johnson, like <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Mr. Johnson. That, that, that sounds a bit, a bit sus, I would say. But, um, Mr. Venus. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so Terra now essentially starts to be transformed. It's all under their control. This is when the very last thing that kind of births the Imperium is the creation of the Golden Throne. I think it said that it said that this is like a smashing of technologies from the Golden Age of Humanity, which is actually at this time, sorry, at this current timeline, it's actually referred to as the Dark Age, funny enough, because it's so... I can't remember the exact reasons why it's called the Dark Age. I don't know if anyone uh, here can remember, but it's essentially no longer called the Golden Age, the Dark Age of technology, when all these like great things were created. And it's so long ago as well, like barely anyone understands it, obviously except the Emperor. So with the creation of the Golden Throne, we have the Astronomicon as well. So it's like a kind of North Star beacon in the warp. And this essentially is like the kind of lighting the flare 
and this is where the emperor stands in front of all of them. He has his armies, he has his uh, imperial truth, he has the Astronomicon, and he's preparing to, in his own view, save humanity, and he launches the Great Crusade. So the, the Imperium is born, and the reunification of mankind begins. There we go, boys. I do have one small thing to read. And I thought, I think Eli touched on this a little bit earlier. And I would like, it's in, uh, I'll put it in the chat here. And I think I'd like Colin to read this out as a sort of a, let's just say the mindset of the emperor as we kind of leave off. To, so we understand who he really is. It's this, this is the part with Uriah here. All righty. Uriah looked into the Emperor's face as he spoke, now seeing past the glamours and the, and the magnificence to the heart of an individual who had lived a thousand lives and walked the earth for longer than could be imagined. He saw the ruthless ambition and the molten core of the violence at the Emperor's heart. In that instant, Uriah knew he wanted nothing to do with anything this man had to offer, no matter how noble or lofty his ambitions might be. Ooh, and that's... That's the true emperor of mankind. There was a, could I add one more thing about of the course, last church? Of course. I believe it's worth mentioning. I believe that in the last church, there was a clock in said church. Oh, yep. That uh, had been, it was broken and had been for many years. And it was prophesied to only ever ring when the hour of the end of the world was at hand. Mm -hmm. And after the emperor was done burning the church to the ground, it very softly began to chime. Oof. Oh, that's hard. Shivers, shivers. Uh, the emperor is literally the bad guy. I'm telling you, there is there is no good. The, the emperor is the bad guy. Him, him and everyone else in this. Yeah, they'd have yeah, to be yeah, a good. Yeah, there's no good guy. But no, no the good guys. I think. Uh, does anyone? So as we've, the Imperium is, you know, it's alive now, and uh, the Great Crusade will be something we tackle uh, next going forward. Does anyone here have any? questions or maybe final thoughts about uh humanity's kind of uh, and humanity and the emperor shall i say their mm -hmm. kind of uh let's just say you know thirty thousand year long uh timeline that we just covered i don't know if it's on if it was on purpose or not but i feel like there's the emperor or like with the has uh some similars with the old ones with between the thunder warriors and the crooks mm -hmm. like the thunder warriors or there's is disposable foot soldiers who ultimately have no place but to essentially serve as these brutes who are supposed to clear the threats. At, at least like the emperor was more thorough. He just, there's like, there's one <laughs> game Thunder Warrior who survived into the 41st millennium. He, he, well, he was a bit, the heresy. And like, yeah. yeah, he did a much better job at cleanup. Yeah. The, uh, the old ones did not do so much, uh, such a good job at the croak. He had the vacuum on full blast, essentially. Who would them all <laughs> up in one go? And I think uh, it's, it's great gilded vacuum. Now, the emperor himself is is a very uh, mi the <laughs> same mysterious figure doesn't even quite justify it because even with all these books in Warhammer, if you are new, like it doesn't, the emperor is intentionally just like there's there's misdirect. I wouldn't say left the mystery because I've said that quite a lot, but <laughs> that's my catchphrase. But uh, it's there's a lot of misdirection because the emperor. I think me and Andy have said this before to each other. Like the emperor is who. Uh, you want him, you to want him to be? Was it Colin? I think I've been. Yeah. yeah, he's like um, the emperor himself. Is uh, he's almost different to every person he meets. Maybe there's a sort of manipulate manipulative uh, undertone to it, mm. or maybe it's just he's what people expect him to be, and maybe we see what we want. But he's uh, at this time now. It's the you know this is the launch, the 29th millennium, and humanity on terror. Uh, you know, thousands, hundreds upon thousands. Hundreds of thousands? Excuse me. Hundreds of thousands of, you know, super soldiers, mortal armies, ships of incredible power are essentially launching towards the stars and war has begun. Any is there any last uh anyone got any last comments or feelings I want to share about the birth of the Imperium? Well, so the Emperor Lore is from a new book, I assume. A new work. Uh I read a lot of it from uh I think I mentioned it in some of my other yeah. things. Master of Mankind, which goes into a lot of like good uh, detail about the Emperor's like, tr it's kind of a, 
it's a very divisive book we've said like between ourselves where it's just yeah i can Ooh. i can tell why people don't like it it's oh, valdor's also it... got some bits in his book as well which mm. have little fragments of the emperor mm. and the thunder warriors so... yeah I, I assume people didn't like it because it uh, i mean it, it just made canon the emperor's origins it kind of took away part of the mystery i think it also sometimes there's like moments where the emperor's like a like a good father in some books and this kind of revealed that he's not he's really not mm-hmm. i'm fine with that <laughs> i know <laughs> i think but, it it I, it was like it was like kind of the mask slipped if you know what i mean in this book yeah i, I had to at some point obviously and uh i think some people don't like what they see because it is in a way horrifying to see a man that uh to be that powerful but yet this with so much hubris i'll say mm-hmm. um Thank you all so much for uh, listening to that. I hope, do you guys think you have a good understanding of the birth of the Imperium? How do you think? Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, uh, I think so. I feel like I've learned uh, I've quite a bit. Quite a quite a decent, you know, injection of lore there. Uh, we will, <laughs> uh, lucky for our next episode. I was, I was, uh, oh, so good. I was going to say, would it be okay if I uh, do the, what's coming next? Oh, the, mm, oh of course. <laughs> Absolutely. Go uh, for it. Now, of course, we the uh, the next time in the mainline uh, podcast, we are going to keep the timeline going. We're going to be talking about all of the wonderful 40k stuff you know and love. But next time, we're going to be changing over a bit. By the time this goes up, the Empire of Man quiz will have been out for a little while. But for the first time in the main podcast, we're taking a switch. As many of you know, mm. I quite like my Eldar. I know Andy in particular takes uh, offense Umbrance to that. <laughs> to it. Yeah. But they are, they are not my favorite Warhammer racer faction. That, that belongs to one in Warhammer fantasy. And one who, if you ask your local witch hunter, he will assure you does not exist. There are most certainly not rat men in your walls. We will be covering... The Skaven race next time. Yes. I'm so excited. The horned the rat. rat. The horned and rat. Both. And Colin. Even this and race. Number 13. They will, <laughs> they will both be doing the entire podcast episode in a Skaven voice. <laughs> we can't promise that. <laughs> I, I, the beginning section will be all in the Skaven voice. So if you hate the Skaven voice, don't worry. Colin's not going to do it. Praise be Unless he does. Yeah, praise, praise number 13, boys and girls. Oh, it's a pity. It's a man thing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you uh, so much for listening, everyone. Uh, make sure to like, uh, subscribe. We, it would uh, really help us out. We really appreciate it too. And um, if you have any questions or if we made any law crimes, um, do let us know because uh, we make a, a quite a few <laughs> often. Mm-hmm. So we would very much appreciate it. And we will see you all next time with the... I don't know how to say the Skaven. What word can I use to describe that there? I don't know if awful the, is the right the word. Best, the best, and most glorious, superior race the, uh, in all of Warhammer? The infected. The best word you can use to describe Skaven? Scourge. Scourge. The scourge of the Skaven. I will the see. asshole. <laughs> the, the asshole. <laughs> we will see you all uh, next time. Thank you so much for listening. Take care, Peace. everyone. Very well, love you.